Hej och välkomna till Erik Pensers Health Care dag 24 februari 2022. En dag att minnas på många sätt. Jag heter Claes Palin och är analytiker som bevakar sektorn och har gjort det länge. Health konferensen går som sagt i tre rum. Det bolag vi ska börja med här är Biomvent, vars presentation kommer ske över Teams och på engelska. Martin Welshoff, very welcome to Eric Penster Bank. Thank you, Klaas. So then I guess I just kick off the presentation. Yeah, exactly. You may start your presentation. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So welcome everybody and I'm happy to participate in the Eric Penster Healthcare Uh, day. Uh, so if you can go to the next slide, please. So this is our forward-looking statement and one slide further. Thank you. So obviously everybody would know uh, we are a Swedish biotech company based in Lund. Our focus, which is the second bullet point, is a novel first-in-class immunomodulation. And for that we use antibodies and our disease focus is cancer treatment. We listed in Stockholm since quite a while and uh, we're close to 100 employees uh, currently. Next slide, please. So these are a couple of investment highlights. Uh, I will come back to the innovative immune oncology therapies uh, that we have running, and we have actually multiple modes of action in clinical uh, testing at the moment. So we have four ongoing active trials uh, at the moment, and we will start our fifth program during the first half of this year. We are a very integrated company, which means we have a, a discovery and research engine, which basically spits out targets and antibodies on a continuous basis. Uh, we also have in-house manufacturing capabilities and cell and generation capabilities, and of course, uh, also clinical development capabilities. And that makes us, I think, very competitive since we can then move very quickly from research to clinical development, which we have done. So uh, just to give you an example, so August uh, 2018, we had one program in the clinic. Uh, now a little bit more than three years later, uh, we have five programs running, uh, which I think is very good. The platform that I will explain to you later uh, a little bit more in detail has been validated through a number of uh, pharma partnerships, most recently with Pfizer. Uh, but we also have antibodies in development uh, with Daiichi, Bayer, Mitsubishi and Takeda. We're very proud uh, about our strong international shareholder base. Uh, you see the names here on the slides. Our largest shareholder is Redmile, followed by Van Hack Investments. And also from the US, we have Omega from Boston, HBM from Switzerland, uh, the fourth uh, Swedish pension fund, Merieu, Setbank, Obur, Invos, and Handelsbank. So a very good list of large institutions, and they own roughly 70% uh, of the company. Since we did two very successful financings, uh, one uh, in summer 2020 and one in Q1 2021, uh, we have a very solid cash position. Our current runway stretches until the end of 2024, maybe even early into 2025. Next slide, please. Before I go into the uh, portfolio that we're currently pushing forward, uh, just a couple of words on our very unique Um, a function screening platform, which is called FIRST. And I will not explain the, the full setup, but just maybe highlight a couple of unique features. So the first unique feature is that we always start our screening based on patient material, uh, which I think is very unique. Uh, we have a very close collaboration with the local hospital in Lund, such that we receive on a regular basis uh, fresh uh, patient material. Uh, and I think it's important to mention that once we uh, collect the patient material, we do not take it into culture or modify it in any other, by any other means. So basically we use it as it is and screen it against our uh, high quality antibody encoder uh, library. And then we identify specific antibodies to the cells of interest. And before we then check what those antibodies are really specifically binding to on the cells of interest, We subject them to a very vigorous phenotypic functional screening and then basically focus only on those antibodies and targets that have shown very strong therapeutic effects in a number of animal models. And then we also identify the targets. So that's the platform that we're using. We have used it, for example, uh, in our collaboration with Pfizer. And for Pfizer, we uh, identified targets and antibodies that are expressed on tumor associated myeloid cells. And that's the platform that we have used to build our own portfolio. 
And as I said earlier, so we're using it on a continuous basis to generate new interesting targets and antibody combinations. Next slide, please. So that's the portfolio that we have generated uh, at the moment uh, with this platform that I just explained to you. And you will remember that I mentioned that we are in the business of immunomodulation, and, uh, and that's why we try to modulate uh, the immune system in two ways. So uh, when you look at the upper panel of this slide, uh, there the target is FC gamma R2B. This is the target which is expressed on cells of the innate immune uh, system. And there we have two programs, or actually three programs, but two different antibodies running. So our lead is BI1206, uh, which is currently in two clinical trials that I will explain to you later in more detail. Then we have a second antibody uh, against that target, which is called BI1607. And for that antibody, we filed successfully a CTA end of last year and will start clinical development during the first half of this year. Then if you go to the lower panel, uh, you see uh, two targets, TNF receptor 2 and CTLA-4. And those are targets that are expressed on cells of the uh, adaptive immune system. So in specifically here, T regulatory cells. And for TNF receptor 2, we have two antibodies, BI-1808 and BI-1910. 1808 is our lead, which is in the clinic since early last year. And uh, just a couple of uh, more details on TNF receptor 2. So TNF receptor 2 is one of the hot and upcoming targets uh, and maybe might be a new checkpoint besides, uh, you know, the successful ones uh, targeting CTLA-4 and PD-1. And uh, it's very, very interesting. And I think we were one of the first uh, groups, companies that started to work on that target and we're still leading the pack. Uh, so we will probably be also the first ones uh, generating and announcing the first clinical data around this target. And I'll come back to that also later in more detail. The other target that we're approaching is CTLA-4, um, and this we do in collaboration with Transgene, where we combine our proprietary anti-CTLA-4 antibody with the oncolytic virus platform of Transgene. And also that study we have started uh, early last year. Just the last comment on this slide, you see a couple of names on the right-hand side. So Transgene already mentioned, so this is a 50-50 joint venture. CASI, so we did a deal uh, in 2020, uh, and we provided uh, under this deal exclusive rights to CASI for China, Taiwan, Macau, and Hong Kong. And then you see two times Merck, so with BI-1206 and Pembro, and then BI-1808. And this is, uh, so Merck doesn't have any rights yet, but we have a clinical supply and collaboration agreement, which gives us, uh, you know, free access to uh, Ketrula, uh, plus also uh, all the advice that we can get from Merck in the design of, of the clinical trials where we focus on combination with Ketula. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, you know, the, our lead program, uh, BI-1206, uh, and uh, this is in non-Hodgkin lymphoma in combination with rituximab. We have a very compelling scientific rationale in anti-CD20 refractory B-cell lymphoma. We position this as a chemo-free regimen since we have a good safety profile. It's first in class, so currently we don't have any direct competitors, and there's a very high unmet need for chemotherapy-free, safe options, especially in second and third line. The three key areas that we're currently focusing on is marginal zone lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, and follicular lymphoma. And for mantle cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma, we have often drug designation. And uh, we've also feel that uh, we have a possible label extension to all therapeutic areas where anti-CD20 antibodies are used, including autoimmune diseases, but I will also come back to that uh, in a minute. Next slide, please. So that's the current study that we run for non Hodgkin lymphoma, and the uh, things that I would like to highlight on this slide is on the left-hand side. So we are focusing on patients who have relapsed or are refractory in those uh, three areas, uh, mantle cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, and marginal zone lymphoma. So those are patients who do not respond anymore to anti-CD20-based therapy. This is a typical trial, so we do uh, first uh, dose escalation and then dose expansion. Part A is the dose escalation, part B is the dose expansion. And we're currently at the end of dose escalation and about to move into dose expansion. Next slide, please. Here on this slide, you see the data that we also announced end of last year in the KOL event. And this is focusing now on follicular lymphoma. We have uh, very impressive response rates. So at that time, when we disclosed the data, we had nine patients that we could evaluate from uh, for follicular lymphoma patients. And out of those nine, we saw 
three complete responses uh, with high quality duration, which means um, you know one year, 24 months, 36 months. And I think it's important to mention that the longest complete response is still lasting 24 months after the end of treatment. So the 36 months patients uh, receive treatment for one year and is now for two years in complete response without any treatment. For the 24 month patient, it's the same for one year. So I think this is, uh, I think, very important. Uh, we have very long lasting complete responses, something very unusual that you see. But then on top of the three complete responses, we have three partial responses and one stable disease. So we have currently an overall response rate of 67% in follicular lymphoma and disease control rate of 78%. So I think very impressive, very exciting data. Next slide, please. So based on that data, there are now a number of things that we want to uh, implement for uh, bi 12 6 endonotrine lymphoma. So as I mentioned, we're currently at the end of dose escalation. So we're about to select the dose for part two and want to move into the uh, expansion phase, which is uh, the uh, part two or part B of the study uh, in the same patient population. Uh, we have uh, a date with the FDA for end of phase one meeting, which is coming up soon where we'll discuss the dose for part two and then the phase two study design, which potentially could be a pivotal study. So uh, this is indeed very exciting. Then also end of last year, together with CASI, uh, we uh, filed successfully an IND for China, and we are about to include Chinese patients into our global clinical development strategy, and that will be implemented during the second part or part B. And then uh, we also have started to develop a subcutaneous formulation, which has uh, several advantages that we maybe can discuss later during a QA. and uh, We have started that early last year, and that will be ready uh, to be tested in the clinic uh, second half of this year. So, you know, quite a number of interesting milestones for BI-1206 in non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Next slide, please. As I already mentioned on the summary, so we are also running in parallel a study uh, with BI-1206 in combination with uh, pembrolizumab or Ketruda. And the important thing here again on the left-hand side, here we're focusing on patients with solid tumors who have relapsed or are refractory to anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-L1. It's a, a similar study design, so we have a dose escalation part, which is part A, and a dose expansion part, which is part B, and currently we are in part A. And we presented early phase one data at the end of last year, uh, which are summarized on the next slide. So what you can see here on that slide, uh, when we presented the, the data, we had 11 patients that were treated. And out of those 11 patients, we had already two patients who have shown positive responses. And this is actually quite exciting because, uh, again, those two patients where patients who have received uh, several lines of anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 containing treatments, two to three lines, are not responding anymore and start to respond again. So I think that is actually quite interesting. And uh, those were one sarcoma patient and one uh, real uh, melanoma patient, which is a very difficult to treat um, uh, form of um, uh, melanoma. And uh, what, what we're doing there next, based on this very exciting data, of course, we continue the dose escalation. And the next cohort will be two mix per kg. And then uh, the next step then will be there also to re recommend to determine the uh, phase two dose uh, for the second part. Next slide, please. So uh, if you look at the space that we can uh, cover with BI-1206, so uh, if you start at the center, so that's where we are in donor and Hodgkin lymphoma. Based on the data, and that's also supported by preclinical data, can move into non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, in the solid cancer setting, we're currently treating all comers. So first responses in uh, sarcoma as well as in real melanoma. And then in the dose expansion, we'll focus on metastatic melanoma and non-small cell lung cancer. And then we can also move potentially into other solid tumors. I mentioned also that there's potential application autoimmune disease. That's not, not something that we're doing uh, ourselves internally, but we uh, have established collaborations that we will uh, use in order to establish preclinical proof of concept. So the uh, application potential for BR1206 could be uh, quite broad. Next slide, please. So this is uh, the second part of the portfolio targeting T regulatory cells, and I introduced this summary already. So next slide, please. So for TNF receptor 2 uh, and our lead is their BI-1808, uh, we have done quite some significant preclinical uh, evaluations and validations. 
and we could establish that uh, we had strong uh, single agent activity and a number of animal models, but also very strong synergies with NTPD1. Next slide, please. On this very strong preclinical data, then we, um, uh, based on that, we started a clinical study early last year. Uh, and we will test both single agent activity as well as combination. And the single agent arm test uh, kicked off early last year. We are far into dose escalation. The study runs very well. Uh, the sites are actually competing to include patients. And our current plan is to give an update on the first uh, data um, during uh, mid this year. Once we have done those escalation, we move into those expansion into those three areas that I mentioned on the right hand side, uh, non small cell lung cancer, ovarian cancer and CTCL, which is a rare T cell lymphoma. Uh, very soon, we also start those escalation for the um, uh, combination arm together with uh, pembrolizumab. Uh, and then once we have done that, we also move there into those expansion for non small cell lung cancer and ovarian cancer. So as I said, uh, the, uh, the trial is running very well and uh, the update will come uh, mid this year. Next slide, please. So last but not least, uh, this is our 50-50 uh, joint development with Transgene, uh, during which we combine our proprietary anti-CTLA-4, which is nicely differentiated from ipilimumab. This is the anti-CTLA-4, which is currently used in the clinic. And we have combined that with the oncolytic virus platform of Transgene. And we just, at the end of last year or early this year, had a very interesting scientific publication in a high-ranking scientific journal where we could show the proof of principle, which is also shown on the left-hand side uh, of the cartoon. So we basically infect solid tumor cells with uh, the construct. And then when this virus uh, starts replicating, it also starts producing anti-CTLA-4. And we could see a very high concentration of anti-CTLA-4 in the solid tumor environment and a very low systemic exposure. And we could also see that we are able to activate CD8 uh, positive T cells, which is also a very important uh, effect when you want to uh, deal uh, or want to establish uh, cancer therapy. So based on this very strong data that we just recently published, uh, we started also a clinical trial, which is on the next slide. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. So there you see the uh, uh, study that we have started. Uh, we are currently in part A uh, that we started early last year which is single agent BT001 intertumorally uh, administrated at ascending doses. We plan to give an update together with Transgene during the first half of this year of, of uh, covering part A. Once part A is done, we go into part B where we combine uh, BT001 with Ketruda or Pembrolizumab. And, uh, and then we will break out into uh, several cohorts and different tumor types that we didn't disclose to the public yet. Next slide, please. So this is what I mentioned also earlier. So besides our own portfolio um, uh, with the programs that are briefly introduced to you, we have, have ongoing collaborations and antibody development with those partners mentioned here. Uh, so re ranging from preclinical to later clinical stages. So Pfizer, Mitsubishi, Takeda, Daiichi, Bayer, et cetera. I think this is a very strong validation of our platform. It means that not only BioInvent is using antibodies in clinical development based on uh, our own platform, but also large pharma does it. Next slide, please. So those are the upcoming key catalysts. Uh, so for BR1206, I mentioned the next step will be to select the dose for part two, and then also to initiate clinical development uh, in, in China, rather start it. So we have an IND filed, as I mentioned. For BR1808, um, and that will happen during the first half of uh, this year, for BR1808, uh, by mid this year, we'll uh, uh, update the market on initial phase one clinical data. Uh, very exciting, because as I said, we probably will be the first ones uh, coming out with clinical data targeting uh, TNF receptor 2. BT001, I briefly introduced the, the concept and the study. The study is also running very well. That's why we plan to have initial phase one clinical data during the first half of this year. And 1607, this is our second ntf segamr mr 2 b uh, should start the clinical phase one study during the first half of this year. In addition, uh, we might see potential milestones from ongoing collaborations and hopefully also additional partnerships. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Martin, for the presentation. Uh, a very interesting presentation. Uh, Maybe we could start off uh, just talking about uh, BI-1206 and NHL. As you mentioned, this next step 
uh, could be a potential pivotal trial. Is it possible to elaborate a little bit more how such a trial could look like and perhaps the time frames, even though I understand that you have not been in contact with the FDA, at least not an end of phase one meeting yet? Yeah. So uh, thank you, Klaas. So, um, yes, so obviously the end of phase one meeting is happening soon, but so we have a concrete date and we're preparing. Um, and then our plan is basically once we have received a response from the FDA to really update the market, um, uh, what we will do as a next step. Uh, so regarding the potential pivotal study, uh, what we envision is something between 100 to 150 patients, um, timelines obviously accordingly. Um, uh, but as I said, so I think it's more prudent to update the market once we had our communication with the FDA and got concrete feedback. And as soon as we have that, we will update the market on that. Great. Uh, and as you mentioned uh, about the subcutaneous dosing, maybe you could uh, elaborate a little bit about that one. Yes. So uh, subcutaneous dosing has a number of uh, advantages. So first of all, um, uh, and that's the main advantage, actually, and maybe I should focus on that, the application uh, is much, much easier. So if you have to have intravenous application, then you have to go to a center that uh, can provide that subcutaneous uh, application. You can do uh, at, 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 the, at your local doctor, basically. So it's, it's, it's much, much easier. And then since more and more drugs are also formulated subcutaneous, the, the whole application, especially when you do combination trial, becomes uh, much easier, much quicker. And uh, also in case you have any uh, infusion-related side effects, uh, those all would be also completely gone. That's at least what we have seen uh, so far when we tested the subcutaneous formulation in animals. And currently we have ongoing uh, toxicology studies and it looks uh, much better uh, in, uh, in the context of infusion-related reactions, much more uh, easy to apply. Uh, and that's why we made the decision early last year and we have been quick uh, to develop uh, such a formulation. And as I said, so it will go into the clinic by second half of this year. Mm -hmm. uh, given the, the better, uh, better side effect profile and so on with the... And, uh, and, uh, for the patients with a subcutaneous dosing, uh, would you still pursue a, a potential pivotal trial with an intravenous dosing or await uh, your subcutaneous formulation? No, we plow ahead full, full, full steam. So we would, we would run it in parallel. So our current plan is that we will continue uh, and, and if, if we should get the allowance to do run a pivotal study, we will do that. Mm -hmm. And then we will run on the side, the subcutaneous, um, basically comparing uh, how that works regarding uh, efficacy. Uh, and then as soon as that data is established, then basically we'll focus later in the study on the subcutaneous only. But we will start, um, if possible, with the uh, pivotal study as planned. Okay. And also, if you just could uh, elaborate a little bit more about the competition in NHL, because I, I understand that BI1206 BI is first in class and you don't have any other FC Gamma Receptor 2B in, in development, in, but, uh, but there's a lot of other stuff uh, going on and, and, uh, and uh, commercial available treatments. Maybe you could just yeah. tell us a little bit how you position Yes, so as I said, so we position this as chemo-free uh, therapy. And I think what should be very clear to the audience, when you talk to KOLs and we, uh, you know, we are connected with the leading KOLs, one, for instance, is Michael Wang from the MD Anderson, who is the leading, world-leading expert in mantle cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma. And, uh, and, and basically, unisono what you hear from all of them, including our uh, PIs that we have at the sites, CD20, anti-CD20 will remain central for the treatment of a non-Hodgkin lymphoma because it's very safe, it works very well. And if you have something that can reinvigorate uh, anti-CD20 response uh, with BI1206 in a safe manner, then this is what is preferred over the other competing programs. So of course, we have a lot of uh, targeted therapies who have a nice or which have a nice efficacy, but a very, very strong toxicity. So if you take those, mainly you are uh, spending your time once you get your application on, on the toilet uh, with diarrhea and, uh, and vomiting. So very, very low quality of life. And also the uh, bispecifics as well as the um, T cell approaches, the same thing. They are effic efficacious, but have a strong 
uh, a very uh, bad toxicity profiles so very strong site uh, reactions. So that's why I think we feel we have a good chance with the R1206. Uh, currently, uh, we're focusing, as I mentioned already, on, on second and third line because there the unmet need for a safer treatment is very high because those patients, they're very fragile, they don't tolerate much. And especially when you uh, keep in mind the very long, complete responses that we already have achieved, that's what you want. You want to have patients that basically are more or less cured or at least uh, uh, disease-free for a long, long time. And that's for the first time that we see something like that. Uh, but uh, based on our discussions with the KOLs, uh, they also mentioned once we have established ourselves second and third, there's no reason why we couldn't go first line uh, and combine it then with anti-CD20 based therapies. And currently we are focusing on rituximab, but we can use it also with other anti-CD20 uh, anti based uh, antibodies. Great, yeah, very interesting indeed. Uh, and uh, also, I mean, let's say hypothetically that you would, uh, this would be a pivotal trial. Uh, is the end game for BioInvent to become a commercial company or would that be for somebody else? Not at this stage. So you can clearly see, so now we spend quite some time on VI1206, which I think makes sense. It's a lead program. But when you look at this slide, so it's 1206, 1808, 001, 1607, and there are even others uh, in, in the portfolio. So our current strategies really push ahead with a broad portfolio, not really focus on one antibody, because if you would go all the way with BI1206 and become commercial, that would mean that we more or less have, uh, you know, not much energy left for those other trials. So currently, we push ahead broadly because we feel that is the best risk uh, ratio benefit. And uh, still, we have a strong uh, focus on, on, on partnering. Saying so, of course, going forward, uh, mid to, to long term, we will become more and more commercial. But our current focus is clearly on partnering. Perfect. And uh, as you are running quite a lot of clinical trials right now, maybe you could just give us a sense how difficult or easy is it to recruit patients uh, given what we come from, uh, the Omicron uh, spread uh, over, all over the world and, and uh, what you see uh, going forward? Yeah. So uh, obviously uh, some, some companies have been impacted heavily. Uh, in our case, it was not so much um, for various reasons. So first of, of, of course, uh, since we're treating patients who are really sick and, and need treatment, uh, otherwise they might die. I think that is a, a very strong uh, motivation to keep those trials ongoing. And then I think the other thing is with uh, all those trials, we have a potential first in class, new uh, mode of actions, new mechanisms that also motivates uh, the, the sites and the uh, principal investigators to really push patients into the study. So cut a long story short, so we saw uh, uh, some delays maybe uh, with BR1206 in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, but not much. And the main reason is not only COVID, but also uh, that since this is a very competitive area. Uh, with the other studies, we basically moved ahead as planned, uh, and we also don't foresee any other problems uh, going forward anyway, since the pandemic obviously is, is uh, coming to an end, or hopefully coming to an end. And um, so far, so good, I would say. So uh, those trials were running very well. Sounds good. Uh, and my last question then is, uh, I, I mean, related to you are are going to present a lot of clinical data this year. Uh, will you also be presenting data at any important conferences this year? Yes, so the next one that, that I have uh, from the top of my mind is AACR, where we will have a number of abstracts, um, but I won't tell anything uh, at the moment. It's just that in March, I think those abstracts will become available, and then, of course, we have uh, press releases accordingly. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Martin, and good luck. Thank you very much, Klaus. Take care.